So happy to see this room filled with people. This is excellent. Um, you know, as we yep. think about our vision for what DC is and what it's growing into, we can't do it without talking about the diverse communities and rich artistic and cultural vibrancy that encompasses Washington, right? And we can't talk about this vision for DC without mentioning the G word, gentrification. Obviously, it's controversial and equally contentious, but the people on this stage work to create equity and maintain relevancy and sustainability in the arts and community. So I would like to introduce you to the distinguished panel we have here, and I want you all to know that we're gonna be inviting you to participate by asking questions by tweeting them at, at um, rather, hashtag the G word at Cultural DC. So that's going to be, that's up there. This is how you can submit your questions. And uh, we want this to be a really robust conversation. So please, you know, as you think of things, send it to us. And with that, you know, I want to ask where is art if there is no place for it to be created? Art space is both an advocate and a developer of affordable spaces that meets the needs of artists. Heidi Zimmer, who is at the end here, she is the senior vice president and property development uh, manager, rather, vice, senior vice president for art space. She came in from Minneapolis, by the way, uh, to be here with us today. Uh, she leads the real estate development division for art space. In the decade she's been at Artspace, she has led the development of several successful Artspace projects, including Brookland Artspace Lofts here in D.C. And she's working currently on developments in Dearborn, Michi Dearborn, Michigan, Memphis, Tennessee, and Silver Spring, Maryland. I'd like to tell people a little bit uh, about what folks who are up here have done before they assume the positions that they had, because it's always interesting to find out where they came from. Heidi began her career in local government. She was a community de in community development and planning for Hennepin County and the city of Minnetonkin, which I particularly am fond of, only because I work for NPR, and if you've ever listened to a, a Prairie Home Companion, you know where Minnetonkin is. Also on the stage is Jeremy Liu. He's a senior fellow for arts, culture, and equitable development. He's an award-winning artist, urban planner, and real estate developer. He's the former executive director of two community development corporations specializing in complex public-private projects. For PolicyLink, whom he works for now, he is guiding an initiative that integrates arts and culture into the work of community development to facilitate and accelerate equity. He co-founded Creative Ecology Partners, a design and innovation lab for community development, and Creative Development Partners, a community benefits by design real estate company. He has authored a report, which I brought up here because I got a chance to, to read it, and it is absolutely outstanding. One that I'm gonna invite you all to go ahead and take a look. It's called Creating Change Through Arts, Culture, and Equitable Development. It's a policy and practice primer. So all of you here really would benefit a lot by taking a look at it. Then we have Harriet Tregoning. For many of you, she needs no introduction, but in an article in, Wa in the Washington Post in 2014, the article headline was, What Harriet Tregoning Meant to DC. So that says a lot about her contributions and experience, um, which has been largely heralded and should be. In her seven-year stint as DC planning director, Harriet used the post as a platform to shape most everything that had to do with the way the city has grown and evolved. She worked at the federal government before diving into local issues at the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and she launched something called Smart Growth Network. It's a way for local and national government agencies to share strategies for managing growth. In Maryland, and this is so interesting when I found this, and I'm sure she's like, where did this girl go and find, look, up, look stuff up on me? But um, a, very, you know, a very interesting uh, position was created for her. She had the distinction of being the Special Secretary for Smart Growth, and it was a cabinet level position, and she's known for having said, the pace of sprawl across the country is a disaster. In case you didn't know who was sitting here. 
Uh, most recently, of course, she was a principal deputy assistant secretary for HUD. Uh, and here, you know, again, sitting next to me, someone who needs no introduction, but you can't call yourself an artist living here in Washington if you've never met, engaged with, or been inspired by Sheldon Scott. Uh, your work is as prolific as it is, uh, you know, generous in its spirit. Uh, Sheldon is as much an artist as he is an activist and advocate for all who make up a community, uh, be they artists, supporters, and appreciators. His work goes beyond a canvas or a sheet of paper, as we just had a chance to experience, as he compels viewers, listeners, audiences to think and question all of our perceptions on culture, race, sexuality, and politics, and his recent performance as art, he ran for mayor. His campaign was a call to culture, action. Minister of Culture. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. But the campaign was a call to action to recognize the value of artists and to protect the arts through policy. So with that, I want to invite all of you to give a round of applause for our panelists. So as we think about, you know, arts being valued in redevelopment, can we start with some examples, some national examples perhaps, you know, where the arts and culture are contributing to good growth and driving economic development? Do you want to take that, um, Harriet? Sure. Um, I was actually just talking to Heidi about this uh, in the, uh, you know, before we came on stage. One of my very favorite projects um, is a project that uh, took place in, uh, uh, in her general area, in St. Paul specifically, a project by uh, an arts organization called Irrigate. So there was a, a, a long planned expansion of the light rail, and I think all of us know how disruptive uh, that kind of construction can be, how it can take years to happen, and how the biggest victims of that uh, activity are the long time tenants and small businesses that, uh, that line these commercial corridors where a lot of this work takes place. So at, uh, at Irrigate, uh, Springboard for the Arts, the City of St. Paul, um, LISC, and uh, Art, uh, Art Place America, and I think Jamie Bennett is here, uh, provided grant funds to basically uh, design an intervention that involved more than 600 artists and small grants to help to let people know that the businesses were still there, that stuff was still happening, and they really planned uh, years worth of programming and events, but also created relationships between the small businesses and the artists, uh, some of which have, you know, have been very long standing. That, uh, that it turns out you can use local artists to create signs, menus, uh, you know, placards, business cards, uh, uh, art for your windows, all kinds of things that help to give visibility, uh, but also create these relationships and, this, uh, and these networks among business people and, uh, and the arts community. And it was incredibly successful. And I think that is a situation that exists in every city at, every, at, a, at any given moment. And it may not be a light rail construction, but it might be a road project of some kind. It might be a very large uh, redevelopment that's disruptive. And we just don't think about, uh, on a routine basis, engaging you know, our creative community to try to mitigate the harm that comes from those big projects, but also to really integrate their work um, into the fabric of, uh, of, of those places. You know, with that, um, I'd like to ask you, Harriet, I'm sorry, you know, Heidi, can you share how the development of artist communities creates vibrant hubs that engage and foster growth of healthy neighborhoods since this is your, your mission? Well, it's, it's close to our mission. I think that um, that is an outcome of our work, but really what is central to our mission is to create permanent affordable space for artists and their families. And a byproduct of that is usually additional economic development and investment and stability around the neighborhood um, that it serves. But first and foremost, our work is, is supporting the artists themselves in creating that community so that they are 
um, supported obviously through uh, permanent affordable space, um, but also through a collection of artists living and working and creating together. You know, it's the rising tide lifts all boats um, concept. And um, Harriet and I had the uh, pleasure of working together on the Brookland project, which I, I think a lot of you know. Um, and what, you know, I go back to that neighborhood now and it's been a very short time and can't quite believe believe what I see, but there was an incredible amount of intentional development and coordination that went into that project. And these things don't just happen by themselves. Um, Harriet was running OPD at the time, and um, for me it's one of the best examples in the country of a coordinated planning effort between the mayor's office, the planning department, DHCD, which is Department of Housing and Community Development, um, Ward 5 um, leadership, the artists themselves, the community organizers in that neighborhood themselves, local LISC was involved. And so we spent about a good three years really listening to what the community needed, what was changing about it. We already knew, we could see the additional development already beginning to happen. And so really wanting to create a long-term anchoring institution there um, is really critical to the success. You know, with that, I'd like to call um, for a short video so we get a chance to see what that looks like. Can yes. we play the video? I think there's a Voice of God? section of... Uh, Calling on you? It's called uh, Art Space Matters. It shows you real living artists living in spaces. <laughs> there should be sound. I don't know if there's sound or not. So this is a space in Seattle, Washington, also an art space loft, correct? Uh, yes. It's we can fill in some of the, the audio. Mary. How about that? This is Pioneer Square, uh, which is now uh, a way different neighborhood. That's Brookland. So a lot of these shots were taken at Brookland, um, some in Seattle and some in St. Paul. Um, can everyone hear? Okay. Our, oh, I'm sorry. Our buildings in St. Paul, you know, have been affordable for nearly 30 years now, and the light rail did come, and the luxury condos did come, and the stadium came, and the farmer's market came, and, uh, you know, we keep, we continue to refinance so that uh, the artists continue to have affordable space, 30, you know, 30 years later, and, and that's, our, we have 46 projects in operation around the United States, two here in the area, about to be a third, and um, creating spaces for families. Um, as you're seeing this in the background, I'm always, it always shocks me that people don't know that artists have families. <laughs> <laughs> you are parents and you have children and partners and you are over 40 years old sometimes. <laughs> and even over 60 years old sometimes. And um, you know, the fact that we have three bedroom units and uh, for families and a lot of our developments just shocks people. So um, this, it's too bad there's not the sound with this, um, but what it really talks about is what it, what it means to these folks to live in the kind of space that they have. Um, we've spent a lot of time really listening to what do artists really need? And um, simple things like really durable finishes and tall ceilings and a lot of natural light and their own space that they can control. Thank you. For so the um, and so the videos online and it's it's about seven minutes in total but um, there's a lot of obviously diversity in artistic medium and our definition of art is extremely broad and inclusive. Thank you for that. You know Sheldon Heidi talks about the conversations with artists um, when it comes to finding the solutions that are on the minds of artists you know, can you talk a little bit about what artists are looking for in the spaces in which they live and work and seek? Um, yeah, um, and for sure. And I think the most important part of that is like who's going to listen, um, because the artists have been saying that for quite some time. And I think the the the, the deficiency in that discussion has been who's been on the receiving end and who's been responsive to that. So to answer that question, that's been answered a million times before. Um, you know, housing is definitely an issue, but the reality is like, you know, most artists you speak to, they're not just interested in artists specifically for housing, 
They're interested in affordable housing for all, in which artists can fall into that category. Um, you know, and some of the needs about the very spatial needs that you talk about are obviously real. You know, if you can't be living in a high-rise luxury apartment and spray, playing with formaldehyde and concrete and like those things like that all the time and expect to be able to live there and dream that you'll get your deposit back. Um, <laughs> but the reality, the biggest portion of that moving from the physical part is sustainability. Like, you know, we want a space that we can stay in time enough to work. You know, I know a very interesting discussion that you often have, particularly in D.C., they're always willing to give artists a raw, sometimes unta unsafe space to go in and make work and, you know, transform. And the reality is the transformation process may take more than these 60, 90 days or up to six months that a developer might be willing to give. So you want to talk about what's really effective, like the issues are not just space alone, but it's also time. Um, and uh, durability as um, well as accessibility. So I think those are important things to put on top of all the physical desires for a space. Thank you, Sheldon. You know, you talk about sustainability, which makes me want to turn to you, Jeremy, and ask you um, a little bit if you can discuss some of the findings and practices that demonstrate equity-focused arts and culture, you know, policies that support culture and the tools that are necessary for what Sheldon, to achieve what Sheldon was just discussing. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, just, but I want to make sure it's not lost that the, the, there's a distinction, right, that Sheldon's making about how artists care about communities in, in, in their total, in their totality, right? That, so the work that PolicyLink has done through this report is to help uh, inclu including artists, but making sure that all neighborhoods, uh, particularly low-income and communities of color, can actually have access to the communities that they have helped grow and build. Right, and so uh, part of the sustainability issue is the beyond the artists themselves that the artists are part of an ecosystem of a community that uh, need they, that they both need each other, and so our um, paper really points to specific policies, everything from the sort of the macro scale, like the art place work to help um, um, ensure that uh, the affordable housing uh, tax credits could be used for, to finance uh, artist space, uh, artist spaces, and for artists uh, as a category. But on the other end of the spectrum, other things like um, uh, making sure that uh, uh, artists and cultural strategies can actually go towards uh, supporting uh, low-income and communities of color to remain in place. And so that's a really important uh, uh, related distinction uh, to the, what this topic is around specifically artists. Uh, one example I want to throw out, um, it's just I learned about it today from the Richard Wright students. Are any of them here still? from the charter school who were here earlier. Um, you know, th um, th it's a local charter school close to the arena stage. They uh, are a media arts uh, charter school. Uh, they have something called Man the Block, right, which is essentially a way of applying their skills as creatives to actually understand how folks in a neighborhood f do or do not feel safe about the pathway that they have to take from home to school. Right, so they're actually using their skills as artists to understand the barriers that communities face to accessing uh, education, as well as dealing with transportation-related issues. And what that does is that helps them inform the Safe Passages to School program, which helps ensure that, young, uh, that kids can get to school and home again safely. Because if you can't get home again safely, parents are less likely to uh, have your kid, the kids stay uh, for after-school enrichment programs, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's a really good example right here in this neighborhood of how artists and cultural strategies can be, really be applied to uh, a, a neighborhood development issue, right? And those are really important because if parents don't feel like their kids can get to school safely, they might make the choice, which many do, to move to a neighborhood where they can get, their kids can be safe getting to school. And that's part of that cycle of gentrification and displacement that happens. So there's so many ways that artists can be involved in helping ensure that low-income communities and communities of color can stay in place as developments happen in and for them. I think you make an interesting point, if I can just yeah, jump please. in, and that's um, how we view art and artists and, and whether they're an aesthetic and cultural phenomenon or whether they are an integrated, integral part of communities. And I, I really think that uh, uh, it's that it's important that we that we 
skew toward the, the latter approach. And I know that uh, one of the last plans I did in the District of Columbia was Upper 14th Street. And planning, getting communities involved in planning, challenging. There are some communities that can't wait uh, you know, for you to have an evening meeting at, that they can go to, and maybe they've been going to those meetings for decades. But getting uh, real representation in the community can be incredibly difficult. So one of the things that we did with this plan, and again, this was a project that got support from uh, Art Place in their first round of funding, uh, was to basically do a temporary implementation of the plan along that 14th Street corridor. And we had so many more people find out about the planning effort and find out about, uh, about what could be happening in the community and give input by implementing the plan. And so it began with, uh, uh, with you know, designing a future park or plaza with a road tattoo. Um, some improvements um, along the street that were temporary. We built street furniture uh, that were the that were part of a, a, a summer long festival of arts and culture. You know, at different uh, nodes along 14th Street, and that people, all kinds of people, came out to participate and to be creative and to and 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 to be engaged in the future of their neighborhood in a, in such a different way than those dry, dull meetings. Uh, and it really, uh, I think it really did hasten some of those positive changes in the neighborhood because so many people came out that it was easy to see, oh, you know, uh, these, and we, and we celebrated the existing merchants and the existing stores that were there, the existing restaurants with uh, street food and festivals and grew their customer base and got a lot of, uh, just got a lot of great input in a way that we never would have in a, in a regular planning process. And, I think that's just one tiny example of how a more integrative approach to arts and culture could be so beneficial in our city. Yep. Uh, and just to um, pull off that discussion, like, I think what um, you're explaining there is an exact example um, of a need for a new conversation that the initial presenter this morning talked about. It's not really about gentrification, you know, it's, um, it's actually should be the D word, um, not the G word, and that's the displacement. Like the development, the, the, the beautification and all these things that happen, um, I don't, not only do I think it's like important that the communities that have been here the longest get to experience that, I think it's our obligation to make sure that it actually happens. Um, I was an ANC commissioner in um, Columbia Heights uh, a few years ago and when I was sitting on the commission I realized that we were talking about things that were going to happen 10, 15 years down the road. So I could only imagine to uh, what it felt for like the community members and the ANC commissioners 10 to 15 years before I moved to Washington DC who sat and worked hard for all of these plans and these development for access to fresh food, for safe sidewalks, um, for all of these things they worked so hard for and then for the conversation now to be almost as if they are not even supposed to be in this place when this was the very place that they designed. And I think that's a real big problem I think for artists who come into this conversation and realize that we have become part and parcel of that process of displacement. We all want better places for all people in the community, including us as artists. And um, I think the, the biggest um, part of this discussion that just has to be had and we have to crack through, as uncomfortable it is, is, is we have to find a new model at which we don't displace the people that motivated most of us to come here in the first place. And artists are really tired of being a part of that process as art washers and coming in and making neighborhoods seem gleaming. And then we become a part of our own displacement process as well too. You know, I, <laughs> you know, I think intellectually people really do want to be a part of the process of supporting the arts. And, but when the rubber, you know, hits the road, the realities of, you know, market realities sort of take hold. What are the, the conscious public policies that would need to be instituted in order to prevent displacement? So I'm really smiling because I've been wanting to talk about this all day. <laughs> um, so, You're in the right um, place. So, you know, I was in D.C. Uh, for the release of the How to Do Creative Placemaking uh, book, and I sort of uh, slightly off the cuff said that for the 11th Street Bridge Project to succeed in 
uh, its goals around uh, non-displacement non of holding communities in Anacostia in place is that it needed a lot more money, right? And um, I still think that's true, but I, I also want to be able to offer that I think there are specific policy things to do that are important that there is a unique confluence right now with how exciting that project is, how exciting it is for both communities as well as for-profit developers and for the public sector, is to think about um, um, the, f uh, the fellow from uh, J.R. Lynch uh, talked about it as a moonshot type project. Well, to actually create policies that are also like moonshot type policies related to that project right now. And one example to me would be something like a policy for Anacostia of one-to-one -one replacement of existing affordable housing mm -hmm. that's naturally occurring. So not publicly subsidized, but the vast amount of housing there that's just affordable as it is now because uh, people have been renting it for a long time. It's uh, someone bought it a long time ago. But if there were uh, Anacostia or that ward specific policies like that, or uh, expanding the this the city's policy around 30% affordable on any of the publicly owned properties to a, a, a neighborhood wide inclusionary housing a zoning policy. Right. So there are specific things that can be done to help ensure that the folks who have been there for the this whole time, making it uh, what it is, and as, as a positive and a wonderful neighborhood as it is, uh, to be able to stay in place. And so there are examples of, of that to, to be done now that with a, a project as exciting as 11th Street Bridge is really opportunities to push forward some in a really innovative policy in DC that could be examples for the whole country. I think a lot of people would share that. Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Anybody tweet anything? Let's see if it comes up here on the screen. Stacey, well, that's, while well, you're looking for a question, could I also weigh in on policy Please. issues? I think that, that, that when we talk about policies, we think of regulations. We think of uh, specific plans. You know, the, the space that government is almost never in is the dialogue space. And I see this not just in D.C., but all over the country that that the very reason people, I also live in Columbia Heights, the, the very reason people want to live there is it's diverse. It's the most economically and racially diverse part of the district. But do you think that means that people, longtime residents and newcomers mingle with each other? They do not. I mean, I love a snow day, right? Because that is the thing that brings all kinds of people out on the street. And you, I get to meet all the kids in the neighborhood. You know, I spend so much money getting them to shovel different people's walks. We have a lot of elderly neighbors, but I get to meet the kids and have a reason to have a conversation, which is amazing. And I think that that, that is a policy. Like, like, we have a problem throughout our city where people say, you know what, if gentrification or displacement is the problem, I have the answer. No more development. Right? That's, that is the answer in a lot of neighborhoods. That's what well-meaning people think. And, and they don't know the people who are being denied the chance to live in those neighborhoods or go to those better schools or to, to be able to move to a, a, a safer place or a place with more transportation options or more access to jobs. And I think that that dialogue we need to have. You know, if it's, if it's a, you know, if every block needs to have a dinner party where you get to invite people who you have never spoken to in your neighborhood or whatever it is, that I don't think that we can solve our problems by hanging with our own tribes and our own small, narrow set of, of people who are like us. You know, diversity is the, one of the greatest strengths of the city, uh, but, but we need to embrace it more and we could use some help. Heidi, you know? do you have a final thought? Well, I, I did see a, yeah, let's clap for that. <laughs> there was a question that, that disappeared and it said, how can, how can we as artists help with um, the displacement conversation in everyday language? And so just building off what Harriet said, I mean, artists are always the leaders, they're always the innovators, they're always the ones that can tell, that can take social justice issues and get people gathered around that dining room table. And we live in a time, as we all know, where uh, on a lot of topics, we're just all talking past each other. Um, and so artists really can lead the way in this conversation about um, displacement in particular. I um, had the unfortunate um, 
I just had an unfortunate incident uh, about a month back. I'm not going to name the state or the city, but I was working in the western part of the country and um, a pretty conservative place. And yet um, really conservative folks got up at the city council meeting and spoke in favor of the funding for our project because it was, you know, it was artist housing. Um, but they spoke against another project that was also applying for funding that was traditional uh, low-income housing. And that, um, it just like, it knocked the wind right out of me. And I got up and spoke and I said, no, no, <laughs> you know, this, this is not what this is supposed to be about. Um, yes, maybe uh, we use low-income financing tools to create affordable space for artists, but artists and first and foremost human beings, and we're trying to promote a diverse culture um, and a diverse community um, that serves all persons. And um, I, I'm starting to see a little too often um, that that conversation start to happen. And I think it's, it's artists and people in this room ourselves that have to always raise our hand and say, that's not right. Jeremy, I'm going to give you the final thought here. Well, I mean, I think the, the answer to that, it, not the answer, one of the solutions is for artists and artist-based projects and creative projects to actually hold themselves accountable to results, right? So results for the population that we care about. So in that case, it would be to say, the next time, go and say, we're only applying together with this, mm -hmm. right? So you can't sever our funding from their funding, or and don't even create that us-them thing, mm -hmm. but just that, and I think that's the case, and that's what 11th Street Bridge is trying to do, and really push for an, a very specific results accountability for what they will achieve. And I would just push the, and the, this community in DC to hold you all yourselves accountable for saying, what do, outcome do we want to see in Anacostia as, you know, as this project is happening uh, so that folks, there will not be displacement. Not that there isn't going to be the, reduce the chance of, to not say that it's about preventing, but just, uh, you know, sort of strategies to help uh, limit but just say, what counts as non-displacement of the Anacostia neighborhood, and what do we do to set those things in motion? And with that, I want to thank you all. I want to share with all of you the opportunity to keep the conversation going. You know, again, let's all work together and be champions together with this longer vision. Thank you all, and thank you.